G'day viewers. In this segment we'll talk about multiplexing schemes which allow the bandwidth of a link to be shared. Okay, so recall that multiplexing is just the fancy network word for sharing. The classic scenario is sharing the bandwidth of a link amongst the different users. I'm going to talk about two different methods which you use to do that. Time division multiplexing and frequency division multiplexing. Here we go. Okay, so in time division multiplexing, this is simply sharing over time. Different users take turns on a fixed schedule at different times. So you can see here we have traffic coming in from three users on the left. And a portion of the traffic is taken from each of those users in turn. So this, uh, this diagram is showing the evolution over time of how the users are sharing one link or a channel. You can see one user here in the pink user 2 gets to send some information at the beginning. Then the user has to wait and gets to send no information for while users 3 and 1 send and later user 2 will get to send again, gap, and then later user 2 will get to send again. And this is our regular schedule that we follow. There may be a very small gap between uh, these transmission times called the guard time just to allow for a transition from one source to another. Conversely, in frequency division multiplexing, the users share the channel by transmitting simultaneously on different frequency bands. So this picture shows the way the channel is divided in frequency. Each of these users has about the same amount of bandwidth to send. The middle user, um, is the, their bandwidth profile is shown in pink. And you can see that for all of these users, they have about the same bandwidth requirement. To share, according to frequency division multiplexing, we just shift the frequency band on which the user is transmitting to a different portion of, of the overall channel. The width of the frequency band um, describes the amount of or limits the amount of the, the data rate with which the user can send. Moving this band around in absolute frequency space does nothing to the data rate. It keeps it the same. As we add all of these different transmissions together onto the same wire, you can see here that we have three channels in three different frequency bands, which correspond to the original transmissions. So now we're sharing the, the, the channel in frequency space. That might be a little uh, strange to get your head around, so let me just draw the time evolution of how we're sharing the channel. With TDM, if we just consider one user, what's happening is that user gets to send at a high burst, they get the whole channel, like user 2 gets to send all of its bits at the whole channel rate. Then they get no bits per second for a while while other people send. When it's their turn again, they get to send at the very high rate, then no bits per second, high rate, no bits per second, high rate, and so forth. So their evolution of their bit rate over time looks something like this. On the other hand, with frequency division multiplexing, all users are sending in parallel at their lower bit rate on the channel by simply dividing the, the channel into different frequency bands. So the same user will have a bit rate like this. It's continuous but at a slower rate. Time division multiplexing and frequency division multiplexing are simply alternative ways to divide the resources of a link. Neither one is inherently better, neither one provides for more capacity. They do have some trade-offs. You can see uh, here in time division multiplexing, it's a little more complicated in the sense that we require synchronization of where to send. This is just one user, so the other users have to fit into these time gaps in the middle. On the other hand, with time division multiplexing, when you get to send, you're sending the information at a faster rate. So if the information arrives from an upstream link just at the beginning time, just here, well, the delay will be lower because it will go out at a faster transmission speed. So there are maybe a few minor trade-offs, but uh, there's, there's no inherent difference in the capacity we're getting. Here's that cleaned up version of that diagram. So time division and multiplexing and frequency division multiplexing are typically used in telecommunications to statically divide the bandwidth or the resources of a link. They're well suited for cases where traffic is continuous and there is a relatively fixed number of users. So classic scenarios for using this te these techniques would be with, for example, television or radio stations. These stations might always transmit. You could allocate them a different frequency band. They can all send in parallel on their different frequencies and the spectrum is used effectively. 
this is good. With cellular systems, such as the GSM uh, is a second generation cellular system, one of the most popular cellular systems still deployed today as we transition to 3G cellular systems. Calls in GSM are allocated on different frequency bands, so we're using frequency division multiplexing to divide the spectrum. Within each different frequency band, time division multiplexing is used to give many different calls a slice of that band at different times. So these methods can be combined. However, there's a problem for the kinds of traffic we would like to handle. Network traffic. And the issue is this. Unlike a radio station or a TV station which is constantly putting out a signal, network traffic tends to be very bursty. It's described as an on-off source. If you just think for a moment about your own network usage, at home you might be looking at a web page, surfing the web, so you're demanding that the network send lots of uh, uh, packets to download the page. Then you'll read the page. While you're doing this, of course, you won't be using the network at all, perhaps. Um, you will be imposing no load on the network, so there'll be a short pause. Then you might do something and there's a burst of activity again and so forth. In short, the load in data communications networks of a particular user usually varies greatly over time. If I just make up, here are different users, user 1 and user 2. These are completely hypothetical as examples. Here's a profile for user 1, maybe this is the different rate at which they send traffic over time. Sometimes they're very busy, sometimes they're not so busy, they're not doing much, and user 2. We could see they might look like this. Okay, that's just an example. What does it mean? Well, it means that, that methods such as time division multiplexing and frequency division multiplexing, which are geared towards continuous traffic for a fixed number of users, are not very effective. To serve these users well in the network, we would need to allocate a bandwidth level here, R, which corresponds to the amount of bandwidth they need when they actually need the network. If we have to pick one level, we want to pick this level. If we picked a much lower level, then they wouldn't have enough bandwidth when they actually wanted to use the network. But of course the difficulty with this level is we're wasting all of the bandwidth. I'm, I'm shading in the portion here which is not being used at any given time. That's a waste. This is good bandwidth, we'd like to get something out of it. Instead, well there's an alternative that we would like to get to when we multiplex network traffic. And that is, we would like to multiplex network traffic according to the demands which every user is placing on the network. And we can do this with what is called multiple access schemes. We would really like for uh, these users to share a link such that whenever they want to send packets, they get to send packets and all of their packets are mixed up on the link according to the, their demands. If we did this, we would get the gains of statistical multiplexing. Remember from early on in the course, we talked about sharing based on statistics as being a way to pack more users into a given amount of bandwidth. You can see that here in that I have the two users, they both need bandwidth R. But if I combine their signals, I might get a load line like this green line, which I'm drawing over. Well, the amount of bandwidth we need to support that is going to be some level I've called here R dash. The crucial insight is that R dash is likely to be somewhat less than 2R. So by using less than the bandwidth we would need if we handled these users individually with TDM, we should be able to serve them, both of them, as effectively. This is what we want to happen. We don't know how to do this yet. TDM and FDM don't do this. Instead, multiple access protocols share this link at a fine in, uh, by dividing the bandwidth finely over time. We're going to look at these multiple access protocols in the next videos. We're going to look at two families of multiple access protocols. One is this class of randomized multiple access protocols, where nodes randomize their attempts to access the median. Essentially, they're going to try and access it whenever they've got something to send. This is good for low load situations, and I'll tell you now, this is what's used for Wi-Fi 802.11. We'll also look at an alternative, just so you can see some of the pros and cons. This alternative is called a contention-free multiple access protocol. In this family of protocols, nodes take turns in a well-defined order to access the medium. So it shows you just a different way you can do things. It's better where you need uh, much more control over the quality of service you'll get. Okay, well let's see these two different kinds of multiple access protocols.